kids. And it's such a blessing to see them. You know, I, my only great-grandchild is just old enough now, and she's getting a personality. And, and we was up at the graduation parade. The seniors drove through, and we was at their house, and she's standing out there going like, it was so cute. <laughs> the parade was over, though. <laughs> you know what? She's got a hold of my heart. And that's what God wants from us. He looks down on you like that. If they would just listen. If they would just do what my word says. It would make a difference. How many of you have said that to your teenagers? Your children? I'm going to try to save you a lot of pain. And don't you think that that's God's heart in his loving word? That he wants to save you from a lot of pain in your life. It's not that he doesn't want you to have fun. He wants to save you. They wanted his attention. And then Peter said in verse 6, Then silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles were, became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who had used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Are people full of amazement looking at you and how your life has changed? You know, I've heard a lot of your testimonies and where God has brought you from. Can people see a difference in you? In your work? In your walk? In everything that you do? Do they think there's something about you that's different? Something in you? And that would be Jesus Christ in our heart. That would make a total difference in our lives. And I ask you that question again. How is your life different since Jesus came into it? I want you to ponder that all week. How was your marriage before then? How was your job before then? How was your attitude before then? Because we all got them. Has it changed? Do people notice? They noted this man. He was, he was been sitting and begging every day. They noticed him. And they noticed that he got up and he was walking and he was jumping and he was running and he was yelling and praising God. We need some of that in here. Yeah. That God is doing a work in our lives and we need to get excited about what God's doing because God is an amazing God. What do you need from him? You don't receive simply because you don't ask. That's what James says. What do you need? What's going on in your life right now? God knows it. He knew this man was there for 40 years waiting for God to do something. And all he had in mind was, see, this is where we go wrong. How he, what he has in mind is um, changing our life the way it is and bringing us into a better situation. How many of you believe you're better off now that you know Jesus than you was before? None of you? All of you. Okay. It changes you inside, and that spirit that lives in us is there to make a difference. Somebody, I was talking to somebody this week, and they said, well, when I hear the preaching of the word, 
something in me is just jumping up and down. I said, yeah. And if you study or you, you're in prayer and, and you just feel that presence, something is different. But you know something? Learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, learning to be obedient to the Holy Spirit is our job. And I talked about this last week. Every time we say no to the Holy Spirit, our heart gets a little harder. Because we're not being obedient to what he wants to do. And you won't see the miracles that he wants to do through you to touch other people's lives. Isn't that what Jesus come to do? It wasn't about him. It was about touching everybody else's life. We need to be more like Jesus. Willing to reach out, get in people's lives, even when they're messy. Any of you have a messy life once in a while? And sometimes you don't want nobody around when you're in that situation. But sometimes you need somebody to tell you the truth. And if you won't listen to the Spirit of God, learning to know His voice, learning to know what He's doing in your life, that's what makes the difference, being obedient. And verse 11, while the beggar, <coughs> excuse me, while the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and they came running to them in the place of Solomon's colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, by our own power or godliness, that's what makes the difference. Sometimes we just want attention. Our flesh wants attention. But here Peter's saying, no, it wasn't because of us. And whenever God uses you in a situation, it's not because of your holiness. Because we all fall short of the glory of God. Now we can let pride come in and make a difference in our life and quench the spirit in us. And we can, we can quench that spirit ourselves by not listening. I remember I had a word for somebody one time and it didn't turn out the way that I thought it was going to turn out. And I thought, God, why would you have told me? It was the truth. Why would you have told me that and not have it turn out right? Do you know why? Because other people got choices to make too. Somebody could be sitting in here and God speaking to them and say, you need to give so-and-so 50 bucks before you leave. I'm just saying that. I don't know if that's true or not. But maybe God's been speaking to somebody here. But the bottom line is, if I quench that, it's harder to hear that spirit the next time. That voice. And every time we quench the spirit like that, we harden our hearts. And I quenched the spirit because I didn't know what was going on. And I thought I missed God, but everything else turned out for the truth. But I didn't know why it ended the way it ended. But I wasn't the only one in the story. We all have choice. You can choose to follow Jesus or not follow him. You can choose to listen to the Spirit of God or not listen to it and be obedient or disobedient. We have to learn that voice. We have to learn that Yes, that is God speaking to my heart today. To call somebody. They're going through a hard time. God puts them on your mind. And you're too busy. I had a young guy that was dying of cancer. And I went up and shared with him. And I said, You know, if, if you ever need me, here's my phone number. 
one afternoon, a Saturday afternoon, I remember it. And he was getting worse and worse and the phone rang and it was his wife and he says, she want, he wants you to come. He wants to make sure he's saved. I dropped everything, washed my hands, went there dirty anyway and prayed with him and led him to Jesus. You know, we need to be sensitive even, and I even spoke to somebody this week, and I told them, I said, you know, I'm pretty close to you. And I said, I would feel bad if I never told you about Jesus. So if you want to hear about him, I'm open. If you ever need me, I'm here for you. And you know what that shows? That shows you care about that person, that you love them. That's as simple as it can be to just tell them. And for years, I struggled with that. Now I don't. Whether they reject it or not, or they accept it, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter if they don't accept it. But I have given them the opportunity. And I think all of us are going to be held accountable for that. People that are close to us in our life, that maybe God sent you to that person and put him in your life or her in your life to make a difference. And you miss it. That's not a good thing. That's not good at all. So he gave them all he had. He didn't have silver and gold. Now, God has, I believe God makes rich people. I believe that he uses people for that instance. In fact, the Bible says he's the one that gives you the ability to be rich. But sometimes we're poor because we're not listening to the Spirit of God in more than one way. We are poor. Verse 13. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disowned him. Have you disowned Jesus? Are we disowning the spirit when we're not obedient to it? Pilate was ready to set Jesus free. He could find no sin in him. But the people kept pushing for it. And here Peter says, you disowned Jesus. You put him on a cross. You nailed him. I don't know how true this is, but sometimes every time we sin, we pound that nail one more time. But it's only by his goodness and his mercy, not our righteousness. It's only by his Verse 14, you disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. life. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like today? Everybody wants to disown Christianity, disown Jesus in the world. They don't want nothing to do with him. It was the same back then. Nothing's changed. There's going to be those that choose Jesus and there's going to be those that don't choose Jesus. And right now we, we can see that in our lives. We took Jesus out of the schools. We've taken him out of trying to take him out of the government, take him out of everything. And this is what we get when we do it. Remember we talked about a few months ago or a couple months ago or a month or whatever it was. You reap what you sow. And every time you take Jesus or God out of your life, guess what? 
chaos and confusion and bad things. And that's why I asked you that question at the very beginning. <clears throat> How has Jesus made a difference in your life since you've accepted him in? Has he made a difference? What would you have been if you hadn't have found Jesus? Ponder that a while. How did God lead you? How did the Spirit lead you to Jesus? That's a miracle in itself. And most likely, he put people in your life to do that and use them. One thing we need to really consider, even in verse 15, you've killed the author of life but God. That's what I want to name this sermon. God. But God. I did a word search on that. You ought to do it. It's awesome. The amount of times throughout the Old Testament and the, good, and the New Testament that it said, but God. They killed him. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. You know, a lot of our lives was dead before we come to Jesus. Then you found out what real life was about. The joy, the peace. Whatever God has done in your heart and changed it. And made a difference in it. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus', Jesus name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can see. It's the name of Jesus. The blood that was shed for you and me. At the cross, we were healed by his stripes. Everything has been done at the cross was done there for us. For our salvation, to be able to walk in peace and not guilt and shame. God doesn't want you to walk in guilt and shame. He made a way, but God. But God gave Jesus his one and only son. To die for each and every one of our sins. To take our sins upon himself. So that he could be our savior and our high priest. <clears throat> he become that sacrifice. But God. And a lot of us need to add that to our vocabulary. I was this way, but God. I'm this way now, but God can change that. You're working on something spiritual in your life, but God can change that. Never take that out of your vocabulary. Never give up on Jesus. 40 years. Abraham waited 25 years for the promise. God kept encouraging him, and that's why we come here today, because you need to be encouraged by the word of God. That is truth. And God said in, in John 14, I think it is 15, John 14, 15, or somewhere in there. God said that the Holy Spirit would come and be with us, and he would be the spirit of truth. The word is truth. Do you believe that more than what's going on in your life? That's a decision you have to make. But God made a difference in me. He made a difference in you. And he's still trying to make a difference in your life today. Now I'm going to ask you that question one more time before we close. How has your life changed? 
since you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life. I want you to ponder that and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it. Because I started doing that this week and I thought there was things that I forgot that the Holy Spirit brought to me. And I said, thank you, God. You're awesome. Because I forgot. How many of you men got good forgetters? <laughs> Wives, how many of men got good forgetters? My wife will tell me something we did with our kids when they was little, and I don't remember it. Not that I don't love them, I just don't remember it. I asked God to help me with that memory. How has your life changed? Since Jesus has come in. This man was that way for 40 years. And the people noticed that it was him. And you know that's the best miracle that people can see in you and I. When they knew us in high school. In high school I had hair down to here. Whoa. Down to here. You guys wouldn't let me preach in here. Now I'm trying to grow it up. But God didn't, well, he did change my hairstyle. But God come in and changed my heart. And that's what he wants for you. Does God have your heart? Think of people that do have your heart. Your grandchildren, your kids, your spouse, your relatives. Somebody that's precious to you. God wants your heart. And then God can change it. He does that by the renewing, taking this word of truth right here. He does that with the truth that we find out that God don't want us just not, that God, we sometimes think that God just wants us not to have fun. No, God is trying to protect you. He loves you. Just like you do your children. Does God have your heart today? What in you needs changed yet? Even I used to ask Aunt Nora. She was 97 I think when she passed. Do you still need change? Yes. I remember one time, I didn't even know it, but she was upset with me. I don't even know why. I didn't ask her, but she come to me and said, Pastor, I got to apologize. I said, okay. She said, will you forgive me? Yes. And I don't even know what it was. But you know something? We're family. And the bottom line is, Jesus wants your heart. And he wants all of it. He just don't want a portion. He wants everything because he can change your life. But you have to surrender. Have you surrendered to Jesus everything? Let's stand our feet. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, don't leave here without him. He died for you. He gave his life because he loved you so much. And that you don't have to worry about sin and guilt, death anymore. A lot of people are asking a lot of questions. I think I told you last week I was talking to my wife's nieces. There was quite a few of them there. And they said the world's getting so bad we'd just soon go to heaven. And you see, what an opportunity. <laughs> Be ready to answer that, will you? Because people are seeking. And they want peace. And Jesus is the only one that can bring peace. How has he changed your life? Can you look back and see a difference? That's what really matters. Can you see the things that God done for you?
Can you see where the Holy Spirit was trying to lead and guide you and direct you? Sometimes you hit it on the button and sometimes you didn't. And more than not, a lot of times we remember the times we didn't because we feel bad about that. But you know what? The word says that he blotted out our sins. He cares for you if you know him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each one that's here today. We ask that you would lead and guide them by your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to be ever more sensitive to your spirit as we go out to the byways of life. Then put those people in front of us, Father. Help us to minister to them, to tell them about Jesus. Just as we talked about last week, that Peter changed. He denied Jesus. And then after he received the Holy Spirit, he spoke with boldness. And 3,000 people were saved. So, Father, you're an awesome, awesome God. I've seen you change even people that are here today, Father. And sometimes we don't know what you're about to do in our lives, but we know that you're doing something. So, Father... Help us to be sensitive to your voice, to that spirit, that promise that you gave us to live inside, to come make his home in us. Father, help us to realize that, that you do. Their spirit lives in us. Now, Father, help us to be the people you want us to be, to reach out, Father, to pray for people, to watch them be healed, set free, made whole. And Father, we know it's only done by the name of Jesus, just as Peter said. It's not our holiness. It's not our goodness. But it's your righteousness and your name. So Father, touch our hearts. Let your spirit lead and guide us this week. Send us to the people that need you the most. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can greet two or three people and you're dismissed from six foot apart. Okay? <laughs>